So I guess we can start. So I'm Dr. Navneet. I've been teaching students from almost two years. And today I'm really looking forward to discussing chronic heart failure with all of you guys. Yes. So let's start with chronic heart failure for today. So the lecture is purely based on the guidelines of AHA. Yes, American Heart Association guidelines. These guidelines are given on 2020-2022. Yes. So these are the latest guidelines from AHA. And we will be talking about heart failure based on this latest guidelines. Yes. Hello, Priya. Hello, Chaitra. Hello, everyone. So we are starting with the lecture. So I've divided this lecture into four parts, basically. So first, let's start with introduction. After the introduction is done, we will see the pathogenesis. After the pathogenesis is done, we will then see the symptoms and signs that you encounter in heart failure and finally the treatment part. Yes. So starting with the definition of heart failure, what is an heart failure? Is it a disease? Is it a disorder or is it a syndrome? See, I had this misconception that it was a disease, but it is not. See, heart failure is a syndrome. It is not a disease. What is the difference between a disease and a syndrome? What do you think it is? See, you guys can comment and interact. I will be able to read your comments. Yes. So what do you think is the difference between a disease and a syndrome? See, this is the difference between a disease and a syndrome. Syndrome is nothing but, see, the name itself means running together. Sin together, running together. See, if there are any set of signs and symptoms that run together, that is what is known as syndrome. So, as you can see, these are group of symptoms and signs. But the unfortunate thing is, it doesn't have a clear etiology. And it doesn't have any clear pathophysiology. So the pathophysiology is not known and etiology is not known. But, but the problem is we have to treat them. So the treatment is also not very clear. So it is difficult to treat a syndrome compared to a disease. Because disease has a specific cause. There is a specific pathophysiology. And there is a specific treatment for the disease. Yes. Good Chaitra. It is a group of symptoms and syndrome has no specific cause. Yes. Good. Good. So basically a group of diseases, if they are having similar set of symptoms and all, it might be coming under the syndrome. Yes. So what do you think is more difficult to treat syndrome or disease? Think about it. See, obviously, this syndrome is more difficult to treat because we don't know what is the cause. We don't know what is the pathophysiology clearly. Yes. So now starting with the definition again, I told you heart failure is not a disease. It is a syndrome. It is a complex clinical syndrome. Understood? It is a complex clinical syndrome and it results from either C. Concentrate on the word either. It could be either a structural or a functional abnormality. See, when there is a structural or a functional abnormality, it will impair the ability of the ventricles. Did you get it? So, this is, this is the meaning of heart failure. Yes, everyone who's commented, great. Syndrome is difficult to treat. Good. So, Recapping on the definition, it is a complex clinical syndrome. It results from either, either means any one of those, either a structural or a functional abnormality. Yes, that causes impairment of the ability of ventricle. Understood? So, what is the ability of ventricle? Think about it and answer. What are the functions of ventricle? What is the ability of ventricle? What do you think it is?
think and answer. I'll be waiting for your answers. Yes. See, basically cardiac cycle has two phases. Yes. Will you accept? There is a systole and there is a diastole. Yes. So during systole, the blood is being pumped out. Yes. Good chatter. Pumping blood to whole body. It happens during systole. Yes. And there is diastole also. What happens during diastole? Filling. Great. Nista, great. It is filling and ejection of blood. So ability of ventricles are filling and ejection of the blood. So now completing the definition, it is a complex clinical syndrome that is due to either a structural or a functional abnormality. Yes, that is impairing the ability of the ventricle to eject out blood and fill itself with blood. Did you get it? So there is a problem in there is a problem in ejection as well as filling. So in the olden days, they used to call it as, see, failure of ejection as systolic failure because it is happening during systole. That is obvious. Yes. And the failure of filling is diastolic failure. Yes. Because filling happens during diastole. Yes. Common sense. So now I've drawn these diagrams for you. I want you to tell me which of this is systole and which of this is diastole. See, there is diagram number one, yes, and diagram number two. Now, which of this is systole and which of this is diastole? Look at it and answer. Which of them is systole and which of them is diastole? See, on the left side, on the left side, I have drawn it in blue because it is carrying deoxygenated blood. So this is right atrium, this is right ventricle and on the left, we have left atrium and left ventricle. Yes. So the right side of the heart the right side of the heart. See, the first thing is, the first is diastole. I'll tell you how. See, good chatra, it is diastole. One is diastole. See, I'll tell you how. We get the deoxygenated blood to the heart from the body through the veins. Yes, through which veins? From vena cava superior and inferior vena cava. They open into right atrium. From the right atrium, blood is coming into right ventricle. So basically, the blood is filling during diastole in ventricle. Yes. So you can see in the first diagram, the blood is coming from right atrium to right ventricle. So if the blood has to come from right atria into right ventricle, obviously the valve that is present over here should be open. So tricuspid valve is open. Same thing is happening on the left side. If the blood is coming from left atrium to left ventricle, the valve on the left side, that is mitral valve, should be open. Understood? When this is open, the diastole happens. Ventricular diastole. The blood is being filled into the ventricles. So basically, this is diastole. During diastole, what happens? Filling of blood. You can see ventricles are relaxed. The chambers are relaxed. So one is always diastole. Yes. Now, the second part. After, after the ventricles receive the blood from atria. Yes. What happens? The ventricles will contract. When the ventricles are contracting, which valves are open? The aortic and the pulmonary valves are open and the blood is going out. So this is Systole. So this is diastole. See, don't worry if you don't know the blood circulation during the during the explanation of symptoms. I will explain the entire blood circulation to you, and then we'll start with the symptoms. But now we are doing the definition wala part. So now you understood. Whenever there is a structural or a functional impairment, it causes the impairment of ability of ventricles to either 
fill itself with blood during diastole or eject out the blood during systole. So now that is heart failure. Now, how is the heart failure classified? Heart failure is classified into two. One is acute heart failure. The second one is chronic heart failure. Now, why? Now, why are we studying the chronic heart failure first and not the acute? See, usually in all the diseases, we are studying the acute part first and next chronic. But in heart failure, it is not that way. Why? See, let me tell you why. The most common cause of acute heart failure is chronic heart failure itself. So, if you ask me, if you ask me the numbers, 80 percentage, 80 percentage cases of acute heart failure is due to an underlying chronic heart failure. So the patient is already having a chronic heart failure and there is something known as decompensation happening and it will cause acute heart failure. Yes, I'll tell you what is decompensation and all, don't worry. So basically chronic heart failure itself is causing acute heart failure. Only in 20% of the cases, you will see de novo. That means heart failure is happening on itself. Acute heart failure is happening on itself. Now, we are focusing on chronic heart failure. See, it is given in the names, easy to understand. Acute means happening suddenly. There is sudden and fast deterioration of cardiac output. That is what is acute. Chronic means gradual loss of cardiac output. Understood? So, we are studying the chronic heart failure for today. Now, the classification acute and chronic again now the chronic is divided into three what are those three how it is divided now we will see the classification of chronic heart failure based on lv ejection fraction so the classification is based on lv ejection fraction now my question is what is ejection fraction this is really basic for the people who are in first and second years, you should be knowing this. What is ejection fraction? Physiology of it. Tell me what is ejection fraction? C. Ejection fraction meaning, what is it? I'm waiting for your answers. See, fraction it is given. So, fraction means always obviously division. Yes. So, what are we dividing? Ejection fraction is nothing but the fraction of blood the left ventricle is pumping out. Yes. The fraction of blood the left ventricle is pumping out. That is what is ejection fraction. And exactly how much is this? I will tell you the exact number. See, it is easy to understand. If you can see this diagram, in the diagram number one, I told you that there is a diastole happening. Now imagine, imagine after the heart is completely filled, after the diastole is entirely done in the left ventricle, in the left ventricle, there will be 120 ml of blood. Yes. So that is left ventricular and diastolic volume so on the left vent in the left ventricle you will have 120 ml of blood now during systole what will happen left ventricle will pump left ventricle will pump 70 ml of blood yes so only 50 will remain at the end of systole did you understand saga good but i want you to tell me the formula of it yes so, 70 ml is ejected out during the systole. So, 70 ml is ejected out, yes, from how much? At the end of diastole, there was just 120 ml of blood and 70 was ejected out. Yes. 
So this is the calculation. You can do it. You will get somewhere around 58 to 60. So we can consider roughly 55 to 65 percentage is fairly normal. Understood. So this is how you can calculate the ejection fraction. Understood. You can do the divisions. I am not really good at max, but this is what is happening. 70 ml of blood is being pumped out. Yes, from the 120 ml. So this is the fraction and anywhere around 60 percentage is fairly normal in a person. 60 percentage, 65, 55. It is fairly normal. Yes. Now the classification is based on this ejection fraction. Yes. Did you get it? Now based on the fraction, we have three kinds of chronic heart failures. One is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Please try to keep this in mind. It is also known as HFREF. From now on, I'll be using the word HFREF instead of the entire heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That is first. Second, second is heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. It is wrongly written as mildly reduced. It is mid-range ejection fraction. Third is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, I told you the definition is based on ejection fraction. Now we'll see how. If the ejection fraction is less than 40 percentage, that is what is known as HFREF. Now, if the ejection fraction is more than 50 percentage, that is what is known as HFPEF. Yes, did you understand? See, more than 50 percentage is fairly normal. That means systole is happening well, but still you're having heart failure. If systole is not functioning, if systole is functioning well, then why do you have heart failure? Obviously, there must be there must be a problem in the other phase. So this is a diastolic heart failure. Here the ejection fraction is reduced. So systole is not working. So this is basically systolic heart failure. In the olden days, we had the terms systolic heart failure, left heart failure, right heart failure and stuff. Now we are not using any of those. But for your idea, I told you this. Chronic heart failure is basically divided into three kinds. One is HFREF. The second one is HFMEF. And third is HFPEF. Now, once the classification is done, we can go forward for the pathogenesis. Yes, did you understand this? All of you that are watching, did you understand the introduction and classification? Now, going forward, we'll start with the pathogenesis. So what is happening in pathogenesis? See, I told you heart failure is happening because of some structural or a functional abnormality. So we will take one of the diseases as example. One and the most common one known to everyone is myocardial infraction. Okay, Chaitra, good. So example is myocardial infraction. Sagar. Three steps once again. Yes, I'll repeat it for you. See, basically, we started with the definition of heart failure. Heart failure is nothing but a syndrome. So, it is a clinical syndrome that is complex. So, complex clinical syndrome. How will it happen due to a structural or functional abnormality? So, what will this do? It will cause it will cause impairment of ejection or filling of ventricle. So basically, that is the definition of definition of heart failure. Now, heart failure is divided into two types. One is acute, the other one is chronic. We are studying about chronic because usually chronic heart failure is causing the acute heart failure. So first, we are starting with chronic heart failure. Now, the chronic heart failure is classified based on the ejection fraction. When the ejection fraction is reducing, that means ability of pumping of heart is lost. So systolic function is lost. So that is known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That is correspondent to systolic failure. 
Yes. If. Now, if the EF is maintained, that is preserved ejection fraction. If the EF is more than 50 percentage, the systole is work. The systole is working or systole is doing good, but there is a problem in diastole. So it is a diastolic heart failure. And the second one is heart failure with mid range ejection fraction. Did you get it, Sagar? Now, the most important thing, whatever I'm teaching you, it is based on the evidence based medicine. This is based on meta analysis that has been carried out by a lot of researchers. So, this is based on evidence based medicine. Yes, these are 2022 guidelines of AHA. Now, according to the guidelines, unfortunately, I told you this is a syndrome. There is no perfect pathogenesis. So, we don't know the exact pathogenesis for HFMEF and also HFPEF. If we don't know the pathogenesis, obviously the treatment part becomes very difficult. Yes. Now, fortunate enough, we know the pathogenesis for one type of heart failure that is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Did you get it? So, now we'll be concentrating on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because there is evidence-based medicine only for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, whatever pathogenesis I am telling you, it is for HFREF, not for PEF and MEF. We don't know it for sure. It is not very clear. So, starting with pathogenesis of starting with pathogenesis of HFREF. Good, great saga that you understood. So, starting with pathogenesis of HFREF. Now, I told you heart failure is caused due to some structural or functional defect. Now, we have taken MI as an example, myocardial infraction. Now, if there is heart attack, what happens? If there is myocardial infraction, what will happen? What will happen? Obviously, if there is myocardial infraction, the, there is hypoxia. Yes, there is decreased oxygen going to the heart cells. So, cells of heart will start dying. That is what is known as necrosis. Basically, coagulative necrosis is happening. Yes, the cells of the heart are dying. So, if a part of the ventricle starts dying, yes, it is not able to contract properly. And what will happen if there is no contraction? Yes, in ECG, you will see ST elevation or ST depression based on the injuries if it is transmural and all it is acs but what i'm asking is function whenever there is mi what will happen the cardiac output will decrease yes now we don't want that why because cardiac output means the amount of blood that the heart is supplying to the body if that decreases yes there will be a lot of symptoms so we don't want the cardiac output decreasing so what will our body do our body will try to compensate this cardiac output. Yes. How is it compensating? That is the question. How is it compensating? See, it compensates. It compensates. First, think about it. If the cardiac output decreases, Cardiac output, do you know how much is it? What is the cardiac output number roughly? You should be knowing this. Five liters, no? Heart pump somewhere around five liters per every minute. Yes or no? If you don't believe me, I will show it to you. See, the definition or or the formula of cardiac output as stroke volume into heart rate. SV is stroke volume, HR is heart rate. Stroke volume, what is the meaning of stroke volume? This is, this is the amount of blood being pumped out by ventricle. Yes, during one second. So how much it is pumping out? I already told you it is 70 ml. And heart rate, normal heart rate somewhere around 72. You calculate both of this, it will come somewhere around 5 liters. Understood? So, 
if the cardiac output is decreasing you want to increase the cardiac output if you are increasing the heart rate will the cardiac output increase or not will the cardiac output increase or not if there is increase in heart rate obviously it will why these are directly proportional cardiac output is equal to stroke volume into heart rate so if heart rate increases the cardiac output will also increase so body will try to increase the heart rate how it how it does it by the help of sympathetic nervous system now when sympathetic nervous system is activated what will happen what will happen it will act on it will act on what adrenal medulla to release something known as something known as catecholamines what are catecholamines epinephrine and norepinephrine they do a lot of things and the most important one is increasing heart rate so it will try to increase the try to increase the cardiac output yes did you get it now what will these catecholamines do see as you know they are acting on the receptors like alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 and beta 2 and increasing heart rate and doing the other activities now one more important thing one more important thing there is beta 1 receptors present on some cells of the kidneys which cells are those do you know beta 1 receptors are present on some cells of the kidneys which cells are those that is the most important thing they are present on jg cells jg means juxta glomerular cells yes jg cells are present in the kidney where are they present exactly jg cells where are they present exactly they are present on the efferent arteriole of the kidney efferent arteriole of the kidney yes if you know efferent arteriole yes along with distal convoluted tubule it is forming something known as juxta glomerular apparatus jg cells is a part of juxta glomerular apparatus now jg cells will release something known as renin yes so renin is released from jg cells why because of beta stimulation from catecholamines now renin is being released where will this renin act on obviously see there is a system known as renin angiotensin aldosterone system yes renin angiotensin aldosterone system so renin will act on something known as angiotensinogen angiotensinogen is a protein protein comes from see most of the proteins are synthesized in liver so liver is releasing the angiotensinogen now renin is acting on that angiotensinogen to convert it to angiotensin 1 did you understand so this angiotensin 1 is being converted into angiotensin 2 again see how is it being converted it is being converted by something known as angiotensin converting enzyme ace enzyme yes it is coming from where endothelial cells of capillaries of lungs so lungs release something known as angiotensin converting enzymes and they will convert this angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 now we have to see the functions of angiotensin that is what is important to us angiotensin 2 will in turn act on two receptors yes angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 receptors so what is very important when it is acting on when it is acting on angiotensin 1 receptor it will cause something known as vasoconstriction did you get it so we will talk about vasoconstriction in a while what do you think is it good or bad vasoconstriction is it good or bad what do you guys think angiotensin 
angiotensin 2 will cause something known as vasodilation and natriuresis. What is the meaning of natriuresis? Fairly easy. Uresis means loss of water. Yes, in the urine. Natri means sodium. So, sodium and water are lost. So, angiotensin 2, when it is acting on angiotensin 1 receptor, it is causing vasoconstriction. This is what you can see. B, what is happening? B, lumen size is decreasing in vasoconstriction. In vasodilation, lumen size will increase. Imagine this is a blood vessel. If there is vasoconstriction, luminal size will decrease. Now, we will recap it once again. Beta stimulation. Yes, beta receptor stimulation on the JG cells, on the JG cells will release renin. Renin will act on the angiotensinogen that is coming from the liver. Yes, because protein, proteins are secreted by liver. Yes, so after angiotensinogen comes, renin acts on it to convert it into angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1, when it goes into the lungs, it will be converted to angiotensin 2. Yes, by angiotensin converting enzyme yes now angiotensin 2 will act on the receptors like angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 receptors yes angiotensin 1 receptors are causing vasoconstriction angiotensin 2 receptors are causing vasodilation and natriuresis yes this much you got it and now coming to the most important physiological link with physiology and pathology this is very important please try to concentrate on it yes now, renin, yes, releasing the angiotensin 2, yes, converting the angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, will act on, what is this gland? What is this gland on the top of kidney? Yes, come on, on the top of kidney, which gland do you have? Adrenal gland. Yes, adrenal gland is made up of cortex and medulla. I already told you, from medulla, catecholamines are released. Yes, now, what about adrenal cortex? Goodness, the ad adrenal gland. What about adrenal cortex? It has three regions. What are those? Easier way to remember is by the GFR. You know, glomerular filtration rate. Yes, G is for glomerulosa, F is for fasciculator, R is for reticularis. Now, what is very important, when angiotensin 2 acts on the adrenal cortex, it acts on zona glomerulosa to release something known as aldosterone. Yes, to release aldosterone. So, this is what is basically happening. Good Akanksha. Glucocorticoids are released, but they are released with the effect of ACTH. Yes, now angiotensin 2 is releasing the aldosterone. Now, what is the effect of aldosterone? Where is it acting? Yes, what is the effect of aldosterone and where is it acting? See, this is the important physiology link and the pathology link. If you know this, you will be able to understand most of the concepts coming with secondary hypertension. Yes. Now, we will see how it is. See, this is a nephron. Yes, nephron is the functional unit of kidney, as all of you know. You know the parts of nephron, yes? So, basically, this is glomerulus, PCT, loop of Henle. Thick ascending loop of Henle and DCT and collecting duct. This is cortical collecting duct. Yes. Now, what is happening? This pyrenolol acton, this pyrenolol acton is a drug that is acting on aldosterone. Yes. Now, we will see the function of aldosterone. What is it doing? See, aldosterone acts on something known as cortical collecting duct. How is it acting on cortical collecting duct? We will try to see it. See, 
imagine this is the cortical collecting duct and we are trying to zoom it yes we are trying to zoom it how do you zoom it not by the cameras we are using the microscope if you take if you take any kind of nephron and you see inside the cortical collecting duct so imagine that this is the cortical collecting duct now there are cells on both the sides of the duct yes i have drawn cells on one side we will try to see it from this side itself yes but there are cells on both the sides and there are blood vessels on the both the sides this is cortical collecting duct this is a cell of cortical collecting duct and this is one blood vessel now aldosterone is released in blood stream yes so aldosterone is coming into the blood vessel next what will happen once it comes what will happen once it comes see aldosterone is a steroid hormone or a protein hormone you guys think about it aldosterone is a steroid hormone or a protein hormone aldosterone is a steroid hormone see why is it so important steroid hormones can easily cross the cell membrane yes so aldosterone will easily cross the cell membrane proteins proteins cannot cross the cell membrane yes so aldosterone will cross the cell membrane yes akansha steroid good so aldosterone will cross the cell membrane what will happen it will it will attach to mineralocorticoid receptors see aldosterone is also known as mineralocorticoid so it will bind with mineralocorticoid receptors now this aldosterone and mineralocorticoid receptors together will go inside the nucleus of the cell yes it will release some transcription factors and what will these transcription factors do it will activate some channels in the cortical collecting duct what are those channels the first most important channel is what is it enac channel enac means epithelial sodium channel guys did you get it see aldosterone is a steroid hormone so it can easily cross the cell membrane it is coming from the blood vessel going into the cell going into this cell and it is binding with mineralocorticoid receptor and aldosterone along with this mineralocorticoid receptor is going into the nucleus and releasing the transcription factors what will they do it will activate the channels first channel is enac channel what is the meaning of enac epithelial sodium channels yes what will this do what will this do it will reabsorb the sodium reabsorb the sodium means see in the cortical collecting duct what do you have you are having filtered fluid coming from the glomerulus all the way into cortical collecting duct and you will excrete it out as urine yes so if some substances are going into the collecting ducts it is excretion if some substances are coming into the body that is reabsorption so you are basically reabsorbing the sodium yes or no now wherever sodium goes water follows so functions of aldosterone what is aldosterone doing it is causing reabsorption of sodium reabsorption of water so there is sodium and water reabsorption and it is causing excretion of something known as which ions which ions are going outside they are potassium through which channels these are known as ronke channels meaning of this is renal outer medullary potassium channels see remember this this concept is really really important so what is aldosterone doing basically it is going inside the cell binding with the mineralocorticoid receptor and it is activating the channels like sodium enac channels and potassium channels there is sodium and water reabsorption and potassium excretion 
Now, where is all of this happening? Where is all of this happening? In the cells of cortical collecting duct. Yes. Now, what is the name of the cell? It is T cell, meaning principal cell. Understood? So, there is decreased potassium in the body because potassium is being excreted outside. Now, what will aldosterone do in the next cell? See, this cell is known as intercalated cell. Now, what is happening inside the intercalated cell? What is happening inside the intercalated cell? There is one more channel and it is excreting the hydrogen ions outside. Yes, so there is loss of hydrogen also along with potassium. So, functions of aldosterone, what is it? Increasing the sodium reabsorption, increasing the water reabsorption and loss of potassium and hydrogen. So, this is what is happening when renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is activated. Did you understand? When 82 acts on 81 receptors, it causes vasoconstriction. See, the effect of vasoconstriction is more compared to the effect of vasodilation or effect of 81 receptors are more compared to effect of 82 receptors. So, basically you will see more vasoconstriction Yes, basically you will see more vasoconstriction. And what else you are seeing? Sodium and water reabsorption and loss of potassium and hydrogen. This is what renin angiotensin aldosterone system is doing. Yes. Now, guys, I wanted to ask you something. Do you know what is the meaning of preload and afterload? Do let me know. Do let me know in the comments what is the meaning of preload and afterload. See, basically I have drawn this diagram for you. Preload means preload means the load that is coming to the heart. Pre it is given in the name itself. So whatever is coming to the heart, that is what is preload. Afterload means the load that is present after the heart. Yes. Now, what is preload? The volume that is coming into the heart. So what is the volume that is coming? It is coming during diastole. It is coming from vena cava. So, whatever volume that we have, whatever volume that we have during the end of diastole is what is known as preload. So, it is equal to end diastolic volume. So, end diastolic volume is what is known as preload. Now, what corresponds to preload? Basically, what corresponds to preload? See, end diastolic volume means the blood is coming into the diastole. Blood is coming into the ventricle during diastole. How is it coming? It is coming from vena cava. So, what is corresponding it? Venous return. Because blood has to come from the blood has to come from the vena cava. Yes. Blood has to come from vena cava. So, venous return is corresponding to preload. Now, what is afterload? See, afterload is nothing but the resistance of iota, yes, LV has to pump the blood, yes, into iota. So now, iota has some kind of resistance. So, LV has to overcome this resistance. So, whatever resistance that the LV has to overcome, that is what is basically known as afterload, yes. So, basically what is afterload correspondent to? It is correspondent to something known as systemic vascular resistance. Systemic vascular resistance. That means resistance of all the arteries and arterioles. Yes, present in the body after the heart. Yes. Now, when when does the resistance increase? See, whenever there is vasoconstriction, whenever there is luminal size decrease. Yes, it difficult. It becomes very difficult for the blood to go through. Understood. So, it will, release, it will increase the systemic vascular resistance. Basically, if there is vasoconstriction, it will increase the systemic vascular resistance. Yes, if systemic vascular resistance is increased, it will increase the afterload. Yes, if venous return is increased, it will increase the preload. Will you accept?
So now see these activities. Sympathetic nervous system increasing the heart rate. Yes, it will increase the cardiac output. Now, when in angiotensin aldosterone system, it is causing vasoconstriction. So it will increase the preload. Now, sodium and water reabsorption. If sodium and water is reabsorbed, the blood volume increases. Yes or no? The blood volume is increased. The venous return is increased. Sorry, vasoconstriction will increase the systemic vascular resistance and it will increase the afterload. Yes, now. When sodium and water is reabsorbed, it will increase the venous return and it will increase the preload. Yes, did you get it? Now, next part. After this is done. After this is done. See, renin angiotensin aldosterone system is causing what? Reabsorption of sodium and water. Now, for aldosterone, there is something known as physiological antagonist in the body. What are they? They are nothing but natriuretic peptides. See, we know different kinds of natriuretic peptides. Atrial natriuretic peptide. Yes, B-type natriuretic peptide. They are released from what? Atria and ventricle simultaneously. Yes, when are they released? See, imagine if the blood volume is increased. If the blood volume is increased, venous return increases. So the amount of blood that is going inside the heart will increase. Understood? So this will stretch the atria and ventricle. Now they will release something known as ANP and BNP. Now, what will ANP and BNP do? It is given in the name. It will cause natriuresis. That means loss of sodium and loss of water. Understood? So this is a good effect. Yes, this is a good effect because it is decreasing the it is decreasing the preload when preload increases. Yes, but the body doesn't want it, so it is inhibiting the natriuretic peptides. So if natriuresis is inhibited, there is no loss of sodium and water. Again, there is sodium and water retention. It will further increase the preload. Understood. Next. See, ADH release. Why is this happening? Angiotensin 2. We have talked about, I told you it is acting on adrenal gland to release aldosterone. It will also act on pituitary. It will also act on pituitary to release something known as ADH. ADH meaning antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone. What is the meaning of it? See, diuresis means loss of water. Anti means opposite to it. So it will retain the water. Understood? So there is again water reabsorption. Yes, so this is what is happening. Now, we'll try to summarize it. We'll try to summarize it and make it easy for all of you. Yes, see, how is heart failure happening? There is an index event. Index event means the cause of it, the first event. Imagine there is some kind of an MI. MI, there is loss of what? Myocardial cells. So the heart is not able to pump properly. So the cardiac output is decreasing. Now, when the cardiac output is decreasing, yes, the body will compensate. The body will compensate. So these are compensatory mechanisms. These are compensatory mechanisms. What are those? Whenever there is decrease in cardiac output, sympathetic nervous system is activated. It will activate the heart rate. Now, sympathetic nervous system activation will activate JG cells to release renin. Yes, when renin is released, it will cause production of angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 will cause vasoconstriction, sodium and water reabsorption. Vasoconstriction will increase afterload. Sodium and water reabsorption will increase the preload. Yes. Next. Next is inhibition of natriuretic peptides. Yes. 
as i told you these are physiological antagonists so the body doesn't want this happening so it will inhibit the natriuretic peptides and angiotensin 2 will again cause anti diuretic hormone release did you understand so these are the compensatory mechanisms happening i am teaching you the pathogenesis because it is very very important yes the entire treatment is based on this pathogenesis if we block the sympathetic nervous system renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the natriuretic peptides i mean activate the natriuretic peptides basically that is the treatment of heart failure if you know pathogenesis the treatment becomes fairly simple yes we will talk about this during the treatment so basically this is what is happening during heart failure with reduced ejection fraction see now now the important point this is compensation trying to increase the cardiac output now what i am telling you is heart is undergoing some disease process example mi the heart is not able to pump properly yes now we are increasing the preload that means we are giving lot of blood to the heart yes we are increasing the afterload and we are asking the heart to pump even more yes the heart is not able to pump itself and we are giving lot of stress and work to the heart yes what can it do obviously it will undergo something known as ventricular remodeling yes remodeling could be hypertrophy dilatation or anything else the heart will try to hypertrophy and try to pump out more blood yes so but but the unfortunate thing is the unfortunate thing is this remodeling will further decrease the cardiac output will further decrease the cardiac output this happens slowly but it happens gradually see myocardial damage has decreased the cardiac output yes it has decreased the ventricular performance and decreased the cardiac output yes now it has activated something known as neurohormonal pathways what are neurohormonal pathways that is what we have studied now yes sympathetic nervous system renin angiotensin aldosterone system yes inhibition of natriuretic peptides yes and adh release this is causing increased preload and afterload now ventricle performance is already reduced your it is already reduced you are asking it to pump even more yes so what will happen it will further decrease the cardiac output so this keeps on happening yes it keeps on happening so basically what is happening heart failure is the cause of heart failure what is it what is happening basically our compensatory mechanisms that are supposed to save us is what is causing the heart failure so that is the pathogenesis of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so the treatment is we have to stop all of this compensatory mechanisms did you understand so basically this is chronic heart failure basically this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in the chronic heart failure see i told you i have divided this lecture into four parts first is introduction the second is pathogenesis we have finished with the first two parts and the symptoms and the treatment is left yes now to make it easy for you yes to make it easy for you guys i'll be me i'll be telling you in a simpler forms see i know these days all the medical students they are what do you say are habituated to shorter kinds of videos example like instagram reels youtube shorts yes if somebody asks you to watch a video for one or two hours nobody wants to watch it yes if the video is for one or two minutes everybody likes to watch it yes the concentration span is reduced according to the studies who are addicted to these reels and shorts one and two minute videos are good for them yes so what i'll be doing is i'll try to i'll try to minimize whatever i told you into one minute yes so people who doesn't like watching bigger videos you can try to watch this one minute and try to understand the entire heart failure so all these four parts i will divide it into four minutes yes so introduction which we have already done the one minute for this introduction yes we will try to revise this introduction in one minute what is it the definition it is a complex clinical syndrome due to a structural or a functional abnormality yes that is causing impairment in impairment in filling or ejection of the blood that is what is heart failure yes 
it is divided into acute and chronic heart failure did you understand now the chronic heart failure is the most common cause of acute heart failure itself yes so now we are studying the chronic heart failure chronic heart failure is divided into three parts based on ejection fraction those are hf ref hf mef and hf pef ref means reduction in ejection fraction less than 40 percentage mef means it is somewhere in between 40 to 50 pef preserved ejection fraction that means ejection fraction is preserved it is more than 50 percentage so ef is almost normal so this is the classification of chronic heart failure now we have evidence based theories only for hf ref so this is one minute for introduction done did you get it now second minute second minute for the pathogenesis yes see whatever i told you the heart failure is happening because of an index event index event example i told you myocardial infarction or it could be many other things dilated cardiomyopathy or whatever it is see when there is an index event it will activate something known as it will activate something known as neurohormonal pathways what are those first is sympathetic nervous system activation it will increase the heart rate trying to increase the cardiac output yes this sympathetic nervous system activation will also activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system what will this do it will increase the vasoconstriction by acting on 81 receptors that is increasing the afterload yes now it is releasing aldosterone that is causing sodium and water reabsorption by increasing the preload and it is trying to increase the cardiac output yes now third is it is also stimulating the adh release what is stimulating adh release at2 now the fourth fourth and the last mechanism what is happening it is inhibiting the natriuretic peptides so again there is sodium and water retention it is increasing preload so preload and afterload is increased to heart that is already not functioning yes so what will happen obviously cardiac output will further deteriorate so gradually gradually the cardiac output is coming down that is what is known as chronic heart failure did you get it this is the pathogenesis so these are the one one minute things for both introduction and the pathogenesis that we finished yes now we have to start with something known as symptoms yes see before starting with the symptoms before starting with the symptoms you need to know some basics how the heart functions yes and the function is happening either in systole or diastole and what is happening inside the systole and diastole which heart sounds are produced yes which heart sounds are not produced you have to know all of these so we'll be studying this see this is basically physiology you might have known about this cardiac cycles and vigors diagram so oh. they look scary but it is not it is fairly simple see we'll try to start with this questions and i'm pretty sure if you don't know this in 15 minutes do concentrate do concentrate for 15 minutes i am very sure that you would be able to answer all of these questions yes now we'll try to see the first one first question so type type it in the comments type it in the comments answer the questions systole occurs between first question what is the option systole occurs between is it between s1 and s2 s2 and s1 s2 and s3 or s3 and s4 what is the answer for the first now the second question s1 occurs before is it before rapid ejection rapid filling isovolumetric contraction or isovolumetric relaxation what is the answer s chetra good systole occurs between s1 and s2 what about the second question s1 occurs before See, now what we'll try to do now what we'll try to do is we will study the cardiac cycle and we'll try to answer this question that makes it easy for you yes c 
see the entire cardiac cycle is based on the pressures that is happening inside the heart yes whatever happens the there are pressure changes that causes closure and opening of the valves so unfortunately we cannot get out of it we have to study the pressures only then we will understand what is really happening inside the cardiac cycle yes now as you know one cycle consists of systole and diastole what is the duration of cardiac cycle if i may ask it is somewhere around 0.8 seconds yes now the systole is for 0.3 seconds and the diastole is for 0.5 seconds yes will you accept now let me make it very easy for you the cardiac cycle seems very difficult in the textbook but once you understand it it is not yes see systole what is happening during systole tell me what is happening during systole see actually 0.8 seconds means 3 seconds for 0.3 for systole and 0.5 for diastole there is one phase happening for every 0.1 second so how many phases has to be in systole it is common sense since 0.1 second first phase 0.1 second 0.2 third 0.3 yes diastole also 1 2 3 4 5 5 yes so you you know now that there should be three phases in systole and five phases in diastole yes we will see we will try to see each of them see during systole there is ejection of blood so obviously the phases should be ejection yes so try to remember this in systole there is ejection first okay so write down as ejection first there will be a rapid ejection next there will be a reduced ejection i'll explain each of them i am trying to make it simple for you how to remember all of this first there will be rapid ejection then there will be reduced ejection yes good all of you everyone who's answering really great keep it up now in diastole yes so diastole what happens filling yes in the stage 3 and 4 i am writing filling again so we are following the same concept again first there will be rapid filling yes next there will be reduced filling yes now in systole listen carefully in systole yes if the blood has to move out of the ventricle ventricle has to contract or relax obviously it should contract so there will be what contraction and there is something known as isovolumic contraction i'll tell you what it is don't worry there is isovolumic contraction now same same follow it in the diastole you follow the same pattern in the diastole see if there is filling before filling i wrote here before ejection there is contraction before filling what should be there before filling what should be there in diastole there should be relaxation or contraction there should be a relaxation yes and follow it i have written isovolumic here so isovolumic relaxation yes so this is common sense and fairly easy why see three phases in systole and three phases in diastole are almost similar yes you kept the word isovolumic rapid and redu reduced yes in systole contraction and ejection happens that you have written in diastole relaxation and filling happens that you have written in diastole so how many phases did you got 1 2 3 4 5 6 so six phases are already done based on common sense next we have to study only two phases yes so we will study those two phases now okay so i will start with rapid filling see you can start anywhere in the cycle you can start anywhere in the cycle there is no problem yes but for this lecture i have decided to start with rapid filling see what is the meaning of rapid filling 
it is happening during diastole yes or no it is happening during diastole c now we will see the diagram of diastole that i have drawn in the starting of the lecture see diastole i told you first phase first phase there is what rapid filling if the filling has to happen think about it if the filling has to happen these valves should be open what are those valves mitral valve and tricuspid valve yes these valves are open and the blood is filling into the left ventricle yes that is first phase that we started with there is filling of blood into left ventricle once the filling starts once the filling starts yes the pressure in the left atrium is very high so the blood is being filled into the left ventricle with greater force yes because the pressure of la is more understood as the filling starts to happen as the filling starts yes the pressure will start to fall in the left atrium so blood will move slowly yes so that is why first you had rapid filling next you will have reduced filling yes now now with the help of rapid and reduced filling with the help of rapid and reduced filling what will happen please try to remember it please try to understand it yes 70 to 75 percentage of the blood from the atria is already coming into the already coming into the where ventricle now 25 percentage of the blood is left yes and this 25 percentage cannot be filled with the help of this passive filling so what will happen there is something known as atrial systole see this is where atrial systole comes in see atrial systole is happening in ventricular diastole yes please try to remember this atrial systole is the fifth phase yes so filling has started rapidly rapid filling next it has reduced reduced filling yes 75 percentage of the blood has already gone into the ventricles yes but 25 percentage is remaining now the atria is not able to push out the blood so what will atria do it will contract contraction happens during happens during systole so atrial systole is happening during what ventricular diastole see these are the phases of ventricular cardiac cycle yes in ventricular cardiac cycle 0.3 seconds per systole 0.5 seconds per diastole did you get it so what happened rapid filling reduced filling atria has contracted and pushed out the remaining 25 percentage into the ventricles now all the blood from the left atria has come down into the ventricles yes did you understand all the blood in the atria has come into the ventricles now what will happen now see it it makes sense fairly easy now all the blood that is present in the atria has come into the ventricles so so pressure in the left vent left ventricle will start building up understood now as soon as the pressure in the left ventricle crosses the left atrium yes as soon as the pressure in the ventricle crosses the atrium either left or right doesn't matter because the pressure is building up because the blood is coming inside understood as soon as as soon as the pressure of ventricles crosses the atria crosses the atria what will happen atrioventricular valves will close did you understand atrioventricular valves will close what are atrioventricular valves mitral valve and tricuspid valve so closure of atrioventricular valves as soon as the atrial systole happens as soon as the atrial systole happens entire blood has come into the ventricle so the pressure of the ventricle is crossing the atria now yes so it is causing the closure of atrioventricular valves this is what is known as s1 did you understand this is what is known as s1 that is how you get first heart sound that is what is known as s1 that is closure of atrioventricular valves now after the atrioventricular valves are closed after the atrioventricular valves are closed now try to imagine the heart 
yes try to imagine the heart in your brain yes i told you diastole diastole means filling from atria into ventricle yes during this time it atrial ventricular valves are open so that blood is coming down yes at the same time at the same time the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve are closed will you accept see if they are open whatever blood is coming into the ventricle will go out into aorta no but that is not happening during diastole no see this is during diastole i have shown it in the diagram atrial ventricular valves are open the blood is coming inside if you can see if you can see these the aortic valve and pulmonic valve are closed during diastole yes will you accept aortic valve and pulmonic valve are closed during diastole now during diastole i told you there is rapid filling reduced filling atrial systole atrial systole blood has come into the ventricles yes blood has come into the ventricles it has crossed the atrial pressure and it cross and it cause the closure of atrial ventricular valves now at this phase at this phase all the valves are closed yes will you accept now atrial ventricular valves are closed aortic valve is closed pulmonic valve is also closed yes now when the valves are closed when the valves are closed yes what will happen the heart will contract why because systole has started after the end of diastole what will happen starting of systole yes now there is closure of av valves aortic valve and pulmonary valve are already closed the ventricles are contracting but but the valves are closed so what is happening there is contraction but the volume is same that is what is known as isovolumic contraction did you understand see if you understand it once you will remember it forever so i am going very slow please try to get it yes blood has come in from atria into ventricles ventricular pressure has increased compared to the atria so it has caused the closure of atria ventricular valves aortic valve and pulmonary valve are already closed so the chambers are contracting during this contraction during this contraction the blood volume is not changing why all the valves are closed so the blood is not going anywhere blood is staying there so the volume is remaining same that is why it is known as isovolumic contraction yes now if you see in this cycle i have started from rapid filling then reduced filling atrial systole after atrial systole isovolumic contraction so s1 has happened after atrial systole and before isovolumic contraction did you get it now in the isovolumic contraction the volume is remaining the same but the ventricles are contracting yes during this contraction what will happen pressure will increase so pressure is increasing when the ventricular pressure increases imagine the left side if the left ventricular pressure overcomes the pressure in the aorta that is when aortic valve opens so after isovolumic contraction there is opening of aortic valve and pulmonic valve so if you can understand the cycle you will be able to answer any question that is given to you yes see if somebody asks you when does the atrial ventricular valve opens it is after isovolumic contraction when is s1 heard it is before isovolumic contraction understood as soon as the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve opens why did it open because the pressure in ventricle has exceeded the aortic pressure since there is lot of pressure it will push out the blood it will push out the blood with lot of pressure yes that is why there is rapid ejection once the blood starts going out the pressure in the ventricle starts falling that is why after rapid ejection there is what reduced ejection did you get it there is reduced ejection so this is what is happening in systole so everything is based on the pressures so started with rapid filling then reduced filling atrial systole then closure of valves isovolumic contraction opening of these valves yes and then rapid and reduced ejection did you get it now after this much is done 
after this much is done see reduced ejection means once the blood from the ventricle has gone into the aorta once the blood from the ventricle has gone into the aorta now now what will happen what will happen the pressures of the aorta will the pressures of the aorta will cross what ventricular pressures so what is supposed to happen the aortic valve is supposed to close yes as soon as the pressure crosses the valves are supposed to close that is what happened in s1 but unfortunately in s2 unfortunately in s2 the valves will not close as soon as the as soon as the pressure is crossed yes as soon as the pressure is crossed that is what is known as that is what is known as hangout interval yes you know hanging out with friends yes you hang out with people and stuff i am sure there is nothing productive happening during hang out yes so the same thing is happening here so this is also known as proto diastole here the aortic pressure has crossed lv pressure so the valve is supposed to close yes but it is closing after a certain period of time yes aortic valve closes 30 milliseconds after crossing the pressure and pulmonic valve will close 80 80 milliseconds after the pressure is crossed did you understand so this timing is known as proto diastole at the end of proto diastole at the end of proto diastole these a2 and p2 is happening that is what is s2 that means aortic valve is closing and pulmonic valve is closing so basically that is what is proto diastole it is an hangout interval nothing is happening there yes because the valves are taking time to close after the pressure is overcome understood now s2 happens after s2 happens yes that means closure of aortic and pulmonic valves as you know as you know during systole atrial ventricular valves are also closed now aortic and pulmonic are also closed understood it is happening during diastole now the heart will start relaxing since all the valves are closed the volume will not change that is what is known as isovolumic relaxation you understand that is what is known as isovolumic relaxation when the ventricles relax pressure of the ventricles will reduce when the ventricles relax pressure of the ventricles will reduce when the pressure of ventricles fall below the pressures of atria that is when and that is when the atrioventricular valves are opening so as soon as the valves open since there is lot of pressure in the atria there is rapid filling reduced filling atrial systole so we finish the cycle so this is how you should finish the cycle yes and that is how you can answer the questions very easily if you can understand the cycle you can start from anywhere in the cycle and try to go forward yes see i will try to summarize it i will try to summarize it see systole systole means contraction as i told first there will be isovolumic contraction then there will be rapid ejection and reduced ejection yes if systole has to happen the aortic valve and pulmonary valve has to open it opens after isovolumic contraction yes after reduced ejection is done in the systole there is something known as proto diastole after that the a2 and p2 valves will close that means aortic and pulmonary valves will close that will cause s2 next there is same isovolumic relaxation rapid filling reduced filling atrial systole and closure of av valves so basically what has happened there is s1 next there is systole next there is s2 yes diastole has started yes diastole is seen till what s1 again did you understand so if somebody asks systole is seen between s1 and obviously s2 
Did you understand? There is protodiastole also included, but systole usually happens between S1 and S2. So, if I want to summarize it, first S1, then isovolumic contraction, then what? Rapid ejection, then reduced ejection. Next, next protodiastole. Then S2, then isovolumic relaxation, then rapid filling, then reduced filling, then atrial systole. After this, you got what? S1, IVC, same. It keeps on, it keeps on happening. Understood? So these are the sounds S1, S2. These are the normal heart sounds that you listen during the during the what cardiac contraction. There are some things known as S3 and S4 also we will study during the symptoms. So the question the question comes here. Yes, systole occurs between as I told. Systole occurs between. When does the systole happen? Systole will happen during what? Isovolumic contraction, rapid ejection, reduced ejection. It is happening after with sound, S1. So it is between S1 and S2. Now, second question. S1 occurs before. S1 occurs before. Closure of which valves? Atrioventricular valves. S1 should occur before something known as what? Isovolumic contraction. Yes, you can see it here. S1 is occurring before isovolumic contraction. If they ask you, S1 occurs after, it occurs after atrial systole. Yes, so remember the cycle. You will be able to answer all of the questions. Yes. Now, S2 occurs before. See, I told you protodiastole is such a time where the valves are trying to close, where the valves are trying to close. Nothing is happening in protodiastole. So after protodiastole, what is there? Isovolumic relaxation. So S2 occurs before isovolumic relaxation. Easy way to understand S1, systole, S2, diastole. Yes. So in systole, you have isovolumic contraction before isovolumic contraction, S1. In diastole, you have isovolumic relaxation. Before isovolumic relaxation, you'll have S2. Yes, S3 is heard during. S3 is heard during. I will tell you during the symptoms, S3 is usually heard during third phase of diastole. What is the third phase of diastole? If you can see, it is rapid filling. See, why do S3 usually happen? Why do S3 usually happen? Whenever the volume of blood, whenever the volume of blood coming from the atria increases, yes, or if the volume of blood in the in the ventricle is already more, yes, if the volume of blood in the ventricle is already more in the diastole, whatever blood is coming into the ventricle, yes, it will hit on the valves, it will hit on the walls, ventricular walls, creating a sound that is what is known as S3. Yes, S3 is usually not heard. It is heard only in younger people and pregnant people because their blood volume is more. Yes. So physiologically can be heard during what childhood and pregnancy. Pathologically, it will be heard in heart failures. We will see how that is. Yes. So, so the so this is the concept of cardiac cycle. Please try to remember this. I've taken a very long time telling this. Yes, I will try to see. I will try to summarize it once more for you guys. This is the most important topic. I've seen most of my students skipping it, but you shouldn't be doing it. You will not understand the heart sounds if you don't know the cardiac cycle. Yes, cardiac cycle is fairly simple. If you can understand the two words, systole contraction, diastole relaxation. Yes, so systole contraction when it is happening. See, it is first isovolumic contraction. Why isovolumic contraction? There is a phase where all the all the valves of the heart are closed. If all the valves of the heart are closed, imagine if all the valves of the heart are closed, 
blood is not going to go anywhere it stays in the same chambers so volume is remaining same so isovolumic the volume remains same contracting in the ventricles the volume is same ventricles are contracting so the pressure in the ventricles will increase will increase compared to the pulmonary artery and aorta so aorta and aorta and pulmonary valves will open it will cause ejection of the blood since the since the pressure is very high there will be rapid ejection after rapid ejection pressure will start to fall so there will be reduced ejection yes now after reduced ejection what should happen the ventricular pressure will decrease yes the aorta pressure is increasing so it is supposed to close the supposed to close the aorta and pulmonary valves yes but it doesn't happen it doesn't happen as soon as the pressures are crossed over yes it is taking some time that is what is known as hangout interval or also known as protodiastole yes after protodiastole these valves will close now during the closure of this valves the other two valves are also closed so heart is relaxing but blood is not going anywhere so volume is same that is what is known as isovolumic relaxation did you understand once this happens once this happens then then atria pressure will cross over the ventricular pressure and the atrioventricular valves will open since at the starting the pressure is very high there is rapid filling since the pressure decreases after the rapid filling there is reduced filling yes finally the remaining blood has to come in that is when atrial systole happens so basically that is about the cardiac side thank you thank you everyone who has attended thank you sir thank you muzaffar sir thank you sahil sir so i guess we have crossed the time limit already so we finished half of it if you guys are interested maybe we will do the second part of it and we'll continue with the symptoms and all on the some other day yes so i'll i will end this session here and before ending this i would like to thank dr sunil sir and the entire team of the nexilo for making this happen and i am very grateful for this opportunity yes thank you everyone have a nice day yes and we'll be ending this stream here